They call it the Roval. With its mix of high speeds and banking and its infield technical sections, Charlotte Motor Speedway's road course is one of the most difficult and carnage-filled tracks in all of North America. Tonight, the top drivers in the Precision Racing League will look to survive the Charlotte Roval. The question is, who will take the checker flag at the end of the race? We're about to find out here on the Global Sim Racing Channel. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the virtual Charlotte Motor Speedway in Charlotte, North Carolina, for the third race of the PRR LR Cup Series season. I'm Justin Prince alongside of the move tonight is Christian Challenger. Behind the scenes is our director, Sean Ambrose, and he's using cameras by the great Dougie Beard. Now, Christian, this is a difficult track in multiple facets because it's one part oval, part road course. But there is a ton of potential danger areas. Talk us through this racetrack tonight. Yeah, this is an extremely difficult track. It's been kind of talked about as maybe even being the most difficult track that the cup cars in both real life and virtual go to now. And I think that really comes from the fact that everything about this track is, is kind of made to trip up these kind of cars. There is no corner here that is really suited for these cars. You've got a big mix of kind of mid-speed with a lot of banking going into really tight chicanes and it just creates these these scenarios where the chicanes are so vital to the lap time that you're just going to have to push so hard through them and they're the only places to pass maybe a little bit of passing opportunities in a one and maybe in a three and it's it's just all about getting the car slowed down getting it turned in and it's it's so easy to make a mistake and the wall is so close i know myself i made that error <laughs> just last week so huh. it's it's probably one of the hardest tracks that we'll see with 17 turns gonna be doing 38 laps here tonight and the track temperature is 122 fahrenheit so it's going to be extremely greasy and i think what we'll see is we'll see maybe the fastest lap time is about one minute 17 then they'll really drop off and towards the end of the run it's going to get very difficult for them but we'll now head over to justin who's got the points for you Yes, indeed. They might fall about three, four seconds at least in the peak race. But let's take a look at those point standings you were referring to there. As Bradley Hawley is on top of the standings after a couple races in. He's got a 14-point lead over Nick Ketchum. And Colton Lane rounds out the top three. And fourth spot is Eric Roberts. But well, Charles Sumner is currently in P number five. Just 19 points separate the top five at the moment. And a lot of our drivers still very close behind that. Mitchell Clark and Colin Carroll just a couple points behind in 6 and 7. There's also the team standings for these drivers. One team has backed out of the championship for the time being. Just nine left in it. But what about Fun Center has earned the most points so far. Already up 26 points in the standings. Number hard knock self. What about Ramrod? is in third in the standings with 136 points. T24-7 and JRS Motorsports round out the top five. Hard Knocks West, North West, Team Zero, and Redline Racing all have earned points as teams as well outside that top five. But there's a lot else to go through. Let's quickly walk over those race details here, Christian. As we get ready, it's a little bit different compared to the ovals. Yeah, this is uh, no yellows this race, which I think is a really big... Uh big difference and, and it's going to make a, a huge difference to kind of how guys manage their tires it is 38 laps so we're going to probably see about uh pit strategy of cutting it roughly in half but there is a powerful undercut to be had so we've got to watch out for that it is 100 percent fuel which allows them a, a, a good variance on that and it is fixed setups and that means essentially you have to adjust to that setup not adjust the setup to you with for the most part but there were a few caution reviews in last week's event where in turn we've seen a couple drivers end up not being able to take qualify times three in total and of course just about five, 10 minutes two laps to try and have the best time here those drivers specifically robert engelman rachel hunt baron hilton who are not able to record a qualifying time and must start from the rear field if they are entering here at the Roval tonight. And we talked about this a little bit before, after last week's race and before today's race, it could be tough to pass to try and get to the field, especially if you're those back cars. Yeah, I mean, it's very, very difficult to, to pass just in general with this high downforce package. And with, with the Roval, it's 
there's not many opportunities to get the pass done. It's more about kind of forcing mistakes from from the guy ahead of you, and and then and then kind of capitalizing on those. There are a couple of true passing points, I would say. There's there's usually an opportunity down into turn one and turn three, and perhaps also down into turn five and six as well. The chicanes they might seem like ideal passing points, but they require a mistake to really get the move made. And I think that's really going to be what we're going to have to watch for here, is to who can kind of trick their opponent into driving just, just a little bit too deep. You, you only need to be about a car length too deep, and it's it really kills your corner exit. So I think that's that's really where we've got to watch for in those areas of the track. Looking at Colin Carroll right now for wall fight. Keep an eye on the time to the left-hand corner of your screen here on the Normal Sim Racing Channel, but... One of the newest additions this season has been that backstretch chicane replacing the bus stop, but it's much more challenging actually than what the bus stop was last season because of how much speed you have to go down on it. Yeah, you're pretty much going from the, the fastest the car is going to be because you've got that huge run all the way from kind of oval, oval one all the way around to almost the end of the backstretch, and then it's the tightest corner on the track, so you've then got the slowest apex speed, so it's... It's definitely the it's definitely the area where the mistake, if you make it, is is going to hurt the most because it, it will then compromise you all the way around to the front stretch chicane and, and it's just very difficult to get the car stopped because of that, that high speed you're carrying in and there's such a low corner speed. Yeah, there were so many people who locked it up in real life today where they of course in the real life equivalent they had to serve that stop and go or end up having a pass through. It can be a major difficulty here today in the real world in this virtual equivalent here tonight for the Precision Racing League. But of course, this is there's still a ways to go in the qualifying session, but where essentially how difficult do you think it will be to keep up a rhythm here, especially just 38 lap, laps the distance? Well, I really think the rhythm for this track is, is, is everything, to be honest, and that's, that's where... I mean, he goes without saying that being in the lead is a huge advantage, but that's perhaps where being in the lead at this track especially is a huge advantage because through the infield, it really is all rhythm-based and, and just kind of keeping the car rolling and keeping the momentum up without kind of sliding the rear tires at all. And as soon as you get into a battle, then that's where, that's where you kind of maybe fall a little bit out of your rhythm and you kind of end up with this scenario where the rear tires start to slide and once that starts happening everything goes downhill very very quickly so i think one one area where we, we should probably really need to keep an eye on is how how guys react when they come out of their pits after their pit stop because it's it's a very big difference in speed we're seeing a huge drop off of maybe three to four seconds over a run and, and then all of a sudden you'll be so much faster and so much more grip and whoever handles that the best i think is is really going to come out on top i was about to ask about that because the distance just 38 laps right normally a lot of times in say a 55 or 65 lap distance we've seen at this track or at most the road courses that would open up the two stopper but that's just outside the fuel window here what do you think the strategy might be like in that case then, since we've seen many times people prioritize tires, but the fuel difference is only about maybe six laps to make it to the end? Yeah, it's roughly around about 28 laps on a full tank of fuel. So there's there's a decent opportunity for people to, to, to really throw in kind of a heavy undercut, and it's really, it's very powerful to do that, and you will gain a lot of track position and time, and with how difficult it is to kind of execute passes i wouldn't be surprised if we see maybe some people who are kind of trapped in the middle of the pack who might not have qualified as well as they think they should have done but have actually got better race pace they might come in as early as say maybe lap 15 which sounds aggressive because it's 23 lap run to the end but it's the time that you gain in those first couple of laps where everybody's still out there on old tires especially with kind of how short this race is it's never going to get paid back so i think feel like that's that's something we need to watch for the guys who pit really early and then kind of try and hold on towards the end indeed and we have a new fastest time of the track by the way bradley holly is just at a 118.2 the fastest time by eight tenths of a second in qualifying so far that time was above this man on the board and daniel Cerver Cervertes moreno with his 118.7 
But keep an eye on a couple of our drivers. Bishaw Jr. is currently practicing at the moment, but Rob Haynes is currently working his way to the final chicane. Turns 15, 16, and 17 in the 29 car. And is looking to put up a good time. What's it going to be? A 19, 119 flat. That is only up to third on the board. A yeah, really impressive uh, lap from Daniel there, actually. You know, he kind of runs roughly around about the, the top 10 in, in our oval races, but really showing that he's got good road course skills here. And meanwhile, one driver has spun out while trying to show off the road course skills. I believe that is Trevor White. Yes, it is. That is currently on his cool-off lap, and uh, that is a lot of damage. Brownlee Holly looking to try and bump up his time. Doesn't do so, though. But Paul M. Johnson did move himself up to second on the board. Looking now at Clark, meanwhile, now in the orange and black Chevrolet Camaro number three. And for Clark, not the best of times it looks like on the board. In fact, didn't even have an official time. And Pat Hardy is also on an outlap. Keep an eye on Harvey here, though. He did a, He had one of the better times in practice, Christian, in this grouping in the 67 in the 118.6s. And uh, he elects to stop instead. Yeah, so we're looks... seeing a, a lot of guys leaving it really late, it looks like. There's only 2 minutes and 10 seconds to go. Why do you think that is? Um, Kind of with the fixed setup sort of series that we've seen a lot of uh, guys kind of wait a long time in the qualifying. There's the potential for the track temperature to drop just a little bit and it, it is worth time to do it but i don't know whether it's a good idea at something like this where you've only got two laps anyway and everybody kind of likes to go pretty slow on their out laps so i don't i don't feel like it's necessarily such a good idea to be kind of putting that much pressure on yourself to to really perform and get the lap in you know I mean, I've heard a lot of times people wanting to see how these clouds form up above the sky. You've seen partly cloudy skies, but that's why I think, of course, Paul Williams is actually practicing out here or what he has mentioned up and towards the top part of the board, but I've heard it happen. A lot more on the ovals. Here, you basically had to have gone about 10 seconds ago if you wanted to record a qualifying time. 18 drivers have done so here. Yeah, it is, it is definitely an advantage to kind of wait for that colder track, but it, you are just putting so much pressure on yourself to get the lap down that I just, I, I don't know. I feel like it's, it's, maybe, it's maybe too much, you know? I agree with you. In terms of the pressure, all the air drivers, if they go on the track, will not be able to get an official time in. The, that means the 18 drivers that did put in qualifying times have locked themselves onto the grid. Let's take a look at that said grid for today's starters for this evening's running of the PR, uh, PRL Cup Series. On the pole is Bradley Hawley in with a 118-2 with a three cents of a second difference between him and Paul M. Johnson. For Johnson, that was on his second lap too. One of the few drivers to do so. Paul Williams the second is in third. Daniel Cervantes Moreno in P number four. Starting inside the top five, one of the top competitors of the season, Rob Haynes. He'll start alongside Colin Carroll in the 20 machine. Mike Rector starts in seventh with Braden Chatley in eighth. Rounding at the top ten, Eric Roberts and Robert B. Sant Jr. In 11th spot is Adam Zemke, with 12th spot going to Alan Dobbs. Charles Sumner starts 13th with John Labas and Nick Ketchum inside the top 15. He'll start alongside the 99 to Brandon Walter. Herbert White, we've seen him struggle a bit in qualifying, had a 121.8 as his official time. Slowest car that reported a time was Colton Lane with a 123.4. The rest of the drivers set on provisionals as they did not record a qualifying time. Demarius Hickenbottom, Pat Harvey, Mike Cantorino, Nick Pruitt, Michael Mitchell Clark, Rachel Hunt, Rob Ingerman. Remember, Hunt and Ingleman having to serve penalties must start at the back due to incident points incurred in the first couple rounds of the season. That's a look at your starting grid for today's event. And what should be a challenging one here? Drivers getting all set in the grid here, Christian. A lot to think about here with this race. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the stories is probably going to be seeing Mitchell Clark move up. I know we saw that he's been fast the past couple of rounds, and 
obviously with that penalty, it's going to be interesting to see if he can move forwards. I I don't know what he's like on a road course. It it might not be kind of the same as how he is on an oval, but I definitely think he's aggressive and that he'll he'll move up and he should be exciting to see some of those guys with penalties maybe run through. One interesting uh, note is Colton Lane being down in 18th. I'm not sure what happened with his lap, but I kind of expected a lot more from him, so he's probably one to watch as well. I mean, his first lap time was, I think, might have been trying to cool tires. For the second lap, a 132.2, and then it looked like, in terms of what we're looking at timing-wise, he then tried to get going and just didn't get a good lap. That, again, off by two seconds. Yeah, I'm wondering if maybe we, we missed a little bit there, where maybe he kind of made a mistake in the last sector of his first lap, and that that might have sent him across the line slowly for the start of his second, but still, it's uh, he's got a quite a quite a big gap to the next car ahead of him. Yep, yeah, just double check that now. In fact, it looked like he might have had had spun around on the final chicane heading towards the end of his first lap. But the drivers are headed towards turn one behind the pace car here. Again, 17 turns is the distance on this racetrack. 2.28 miles on the Charlotte Roval. And a very challenging one here in Concord. Again, 38 laps as mentioned the distance. One hour timer. However, expecting to go about 50 minutes or so the race distance. But again, Bradley Hawley will lead them into turn one of the North Star title machine. It's going to be a tricky one for these drivers, to say the very least, as they warm up their tires behind the pace car. Yeah, and the biggest thing here is definitely going to be kind of getting away cleanly at the start. With, with there being no yellows at all, there is no opportunity if you get spun around or you make a major mistake and lose a lot of track position right at the start. It's, it's, it's very... It's it's very strange to kind of see this with the with say an oval series on a road course because it's a completely different style of racing to what everybody's used to. There is there is no opportunity to go. Oh well, okay, well it's okay. I've made a mistake. I've spun out, but there'll be a yellow and I'll get back. But there is there is none of that, and it makes the first lap so critical. And with such a challenging track, I think. The, the biggest thing that anybody can do to have a good race here is to just kind of get in line, get around the first lap, and, and then assess kind of where they are and how they're going to run from that. You mentioned wanting to see how Mitchell Clark would do in terms of running. Who else should we keep an eye on today as we get ready for this green flag? Well, I, I had a look through the practice times, and there's a couple of our guys who ran a little bit quicker in practice then they, they're kind of starting. Pat Harvey ran an 18.6 in practice. And obviously, if, if he'd have ran that in qualifying, he didn't qualify, but that would have put him as high as third. So he's starting 20th. I think it'll be interesting to see if he can back that pace up in the race and if he can go forwards. Drivers making their way through that brand new backstretch chicane. Again, we've seen the Peak Series make that debut with it before the real world drivers attacked it just this past weekend and even just a couple hours ago with the Cup Series race with the Bank of America Roval 400. But the drivers working their way down the front stretch here. Remember, they're going to have to start in the chicane here on the iRacing service rather than cut through the turn four quad oval. Yeah, that does make this start very tricky, actually, because the green comes out as the leader is kind of navigating the chicane. So I guess... Uh, we need to watch for maybe some uh, interesting action going through there. Pace car is off the track. Green flag waiting up for the stand. To the low pedal they go. We're racing at the Roval. Paul M. Johnson already taps himself on the outside wall. Loses the race lead to Bradley Hawley as they dive their way to the top top for turn. And other than that contact by Johnson to the outside wall, it looks like the rest of the front runners able to get through cleanly. Much of the field already single file, Christian. Yeah, and it looks like uh, there was a little check up in the mid pack that's kind of allowed a bit of a breakaway group to form at the front already. Johnson now having some right side damage to deal with Paul M. Johnson specifically in the 17 machine as they work their way back onto the banking of the NASCAR Oval. Johnson again, both the Johnsons nearly scraping the wall on the exit of turn number one as they go through NASCAR 2. 
turns 9 and 10 on this road course. As much as 160 plus miles an hour into the braking zone on that backstretch chicane. And it'll be interesting to see if that damage... Oh, we've got a car just skipping the chicane here. It's the first one, I assume, of many that we'll see tonight. That's my corrector that didn't even take the chicane, having to take the time penalty. As mentioned, the real world equivalent would have been a stop and go. It's a time penalty specifically on iRacing, and that lost the 51 tons of spots, as you see. Players taking the strike for the first time. Give the lead lap to Holly. The battle for second sees Paul Williams the second. Try make second work. No, Paul M. Johnson crosses him back. And that is one of our passing points is maybe into turn one. You can get up a bit of a run out of that chicane. And I think there and maybe some of the corners in the infield, three and perhaps five and six, are where we're going to see the majority of passes made. Now, meanwhile, Rector, by the way, with that course cut, has already dropped to 12 position in the 51 machine. That is minus five from the start. We still keep an eye for the second for key number two. Daniel Severtes Moreno still watching on behind as well as they get back onto the oval. Already a 3.2 second gap already to the race leader of Holly. And it's actually just got even worse for Richter. As I was mentioning, turn six, I saw him go off there and looked like he dragged the wall a little bit. So he's now gone way in, into the back of the field. Let's take a look at this here, Christian. And this is, has been a disaster for the 51 so far. Yeah, I think he was trying to serve his slowdown penalty. He, I mean, he picked it up on the first lap, which is always a, a huge time penalty and very hard to give up. And it just looked like he kind of made a mistake that we've seen a lot in real life, actually, just kind of missing the corner and getting out there on that grass. And now he's coming down pit road. So it looks like Rector has gone all the way from a decent starting position in seventh, already to the pit lane with some left side damage with that contact in the inner loop. Let's look back, though, towards now P3 because Paul Johnson has pulled away, but Williams now has to deal with Cervantes, Moreno, and Rob Haynes, who are trying to gain some time behind them. On their first lap, they're in the one last time by. They were all in the 120s within a couple tenths of each other. Yeah, and I think from this kind of point forwards, we're, we're going to see who can kind of keep the tires, especially the rear tires on the car the best. Now, Haynes wasn't really all that fast in practice, and in qualifying, he kind of was one of the few guys actually stepped up his pace. So it'll be interesting to see if he's going to have good long run pace or if he's going to kind of fade a little bit. P17 is also starting to heat up as it's side by side battling on the NASCAR Oval. Pick and bottom on the high side, white on the low side. Lay is also in this mix as well as Pat Harvey as some drivers backing off, others are not. Heading into the back stretch chicane, Pat Harvey trying to make the move, but the Turtles launch Hainarello, Hickenbottom has a terrible run through the, through the backstretch chicane. Yeah, he really kind of didn't get out of the corner at all. I don't know if he was the wrong, in the wrong gear or what, but he just had no pull on exit and got completely swamped. It just looked like they lost the back tires on the second glance there, and then just couldn't get himself back in the gas. Yeah, it's, we've talked a little bit about that back, backstretch chicane and how difficult it is, and and that's that's really why if you just get in just a little bit too deep, it it throws you for the entire rest of the lap, really. It definitely threw him through a loop. Heckenbottom has lost a few more spots as a result. By the way, Rector is already back on the track, already a lap down in 24 spots. As we look at the race leader, Bradley Hawley, already looking like the class of the field in the 118s. Everybody else is in the 119s on downward in terms of timing. That is half a second quicker last time by, and he's still gaining this lead. Yeah, he is He is gone. He has checked out already. He's got 4.3 seconds the last time past the post, so I don't think we're seeing him again for the rest of the day. And we'll take a look where Carol and Haynes are back right now. As again, Carol and Haynes have actually lost ground. Haynes has actually lost fifth. Colin Carroll trying to hold on to the top five spot now. He does have some damage to deal with here for Hard Knock Sim Sports, but it currently has about a car length advantage over Haynes. Not a good run out of turn one, but Haynes can't make the jump go. As you mentioned, very hard to pass. Yeah, it's it's just there's no there's kind of no real area where 
I mean, it's got an opportunity here, actually. But again, it kind of just runs out of straightaway to, to get up and get to him, but the, the 20 having that damage, it'll be interesting to see if that kind of slows him down at all on the oval. That might make it easier for Rob to get a run on him into one of the two chicanes, but the breaking is just so difficult for them that it's it's almost impossible to, to properly execute a pass, and we can see he's fallen maybe five to six talents back here already. Yeah, they also, he also has Brendan Chatley also getting inside his trap. But Haynes taking the breaking zone a bit more aggressively and staying off the turtles. Well, Carol seems to prefer using those turtles to get around the chicane. Yeah, I initially thought that maybe Rob had gone in too deep there, but he really got the car pulled up, and it just looks like that's kind of his line to not be on the curbs at all. And that's, that's going to help him with tire wear, but he is giving up a little bit of lap time to do that. And you mentioned there the tire wear and lap time difference. What else is the difference between wanting to, say, ride those turtles like a skateboard and wanting to avoid them so you don't get pin pond up them? Well, that's the thing. There's a lot of risk in using those turtles because if you get it even slightly wrong in either chicane and you, you carry too much speed or you get a really bad bounce off them, there's a wall right there. And... You, you you will end up in it if you if you just get it slightly wrong but there is a lot of lap time so it, it's a it's a balancing act between how far you want to push it and kind of how much you you, you really like the the front fenders on your car yeah uh there was a lot of cars in real life that ended up getting a lot of damage around those spots but haynes wants to try and get back in the top five still late breaks in Actually had to lock up the brakes a touch. He carried a bit too much speed, nearly hit the back end of Carroll and loses ground on the exit of the, of the backstretch chicane. Yeah, he looks really good into that chicane in terms of raw pace, but it looks like he's just actually trying to get too much out of it. I feel like if he just backed the braking up maybe a car length or two, then he'd be he'd be right on him coming out of the corner and maybe have a chance down into the down in the front stretch chicane. Yeah, now this is going to take him a couple laps potentially to get himself back because he lost four tenths that lap in part because of how rough the exit of that backstretch chicane was. Again, the gap between them and the race leader is still 13 seconds at the moment. P17 is still haptic though. Colton Lane has gotten up to that spot in front of Pat Harvey. It has calmed down a touch, but they are catching up to Trevor White. Colton Lane, however, nearly said hello to the Tums Heartburn advertising boards. Yeah, I was I was kind of wondering who was going to be our first victim of the Heartburn turn, and he nearly was Colton Lane there. He got it stopped just in time. He he lost a lot of time on the exit because of it, but at least he didn't end up in the wall. And Lane trying to attack hard, coming out of the corner, nearly runs over the back end of White, has to check up hard. And that brown and black machine did get damage indeed from that. He's losing control off the grip. Well, Moreno's having some trouble. Moreno losing spots. Take a look at this replay. Minus four already on the lap as he had a bad backstretch chicane. And let's take a look at this, Christian, because... He had a lot more trouble than some of our drivers today so far. Yeah, it looked like he kind of got through the first part okay and then just got in the power too hard and, and looped it around. I've actually not really seen that happen that much, but it comes comes back to the track temperature being so high, about 122, and we're about seven or eight laps in now on tires, and yeah, that it's kind of the point where that, that rear grip really does start to go away, and if you're just too aggressive on the power, that... That can happen to you. Yeah, he ended up falling down to 8th position with that. 20 seconds back the leader. They got a little bit of damage from that contact with the wall now on the left and right side. So still a ways to go though in this event. We're punching 30 laps to go this time by. By the way, Lane has also just made the pass on Trevor White after a bit of a dicey past couple laps. We've also seen Mike Cantorino fall away from that battle. This battle's heating up, though, between Carroll and once again Rob Haynes, who is reeled back in the 20 machine after gaining a half a second back after losing four tenths just a couple laps ago. 
Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if, as, as the tires wear, the, the kind of the balance, the power changes between these two. And we can keep seeing that Haynes keeps getting close, but he's never actually able to execute the pass. What's he going to have to do here to try and get this pass done? He does have lap traffic in front of him. Remember Hickam bottom? He's now lost his front corp as the lap down. I think his best bet here really is to just get right on his bumper and then just sit there for a couple of laps and kind of kind of map out where he's strong versus Carol and, and, and then maybe kind of just press a little bit more in those areas and maybe get Carol a little bit unsettled and and then an opportunity might arise. But if that doesn't work, then his other opportunity is to go for a big undercut in the pit stop and we're only nine laps in, but I did say that we might see guys pitting as early as lap 15, and, and maybe that's an opportunity for, for Haynes to do that, because he does look like he's got more pace. Again, taking the chicane very well, the lap traffic moving out of the way again, that's Hickenbottom, who's involved in that scuffling for P17, but Carroll, not as quick this time through NASCAR 3 and 4 to the final chicane. Quick right, back to the quick lap. Both of them touching the turtles this time by. This time 127 for Hayes. Both of them near identical in fact. As Hayes continues to have a more forward press breaking zone. The battle for seventh that's heating up as well. Zepke now attacking the fourth position. Got to the inside of the 25 machine. Get able to get the pass done off of turn two. Let's take a look at this one. You mentioned turn one being a good passing opportunity. Zepke took it. After having a position and nearly losing it back. It went for a pretty defensive line, but that kind of does show you that the opportunity is there to at least run the cars side by side through that first corner. So maybe kind of the opposite way around, that's an opportunity for somebody. If uh, the guy ahead of you kind of gets a poor exit off the chicane, if you can just about duck to his inside, then you'll then you'll have a shot at it getting down to, through one, two, and maybe even carrying all the way down to three. And Zemke trying to run away. Remember, that car in eighth spot in Cervantes Moreno was the one who ended up losing control here just a couple laps ago. They do have lap traffic behind in Mike Rector, but Rector not on the same pace level. Cervantes Moreno getting a good run. Zemke looking like he's just going to let him go in his green and blue machine. So move Daniel back up to P7. Yeah, to be honest, that's smart. I mean, we've seen that Daniel was was definitely faster and, and it had a lot of pace indeed and p5 has also just ha changed hands in that corner and that was because the 20 machine lost grip on the final corner to lose the spot and you can see he just doesn't really get a good exit and then haynes really was able to really take a lot more advantage of that than i expected on the outside and Really opportunistic, but a good move by him. It almost looked like he hit the turtle too hard, and it just, when the suspension came back down, it just lifted up the left rears and got him out of shape. Yeah, the turtles through that last chicane are really interesting. You can't really hit the one on the right-hander at all because there's there's an off-track 1x there, and also it doesn't really gain you much lap time. But the, the left-hander, if you... If you get it right, you can almost shortcut across the entire turtle, but the the precision required to get that right is is so so fine that obviously if you get it just a little bit wrong, you can kind of really lose a lot of time there by unsettling the car, especially on the landing. One thing, quick thing to note, Trevor White has just ducked down to the pit lane. He had troubles with his car as we've seen a couple times. He's off, off the racetrack at the moment. 26 laps to go this time by for the lead cars. But again, Bradley Hawley is in the lead by 10 seconds. Let's look at key nine though. That's where Eric Roberts is trying to hold on to the position on Alan Dobbs. Dobbs has already taken a beanie. You might notice a little bit with both sides of the front end and on the hood. Yeah, he's he's up two, sp two positions on where he started though, so. I'm wondering if, if he kind of had to be a bit aggressive to get those spots. And Dean, is that something you feel you have to do to be able to keep on moving forward with the toughness there? Or do you have to wait? As you mentioned, you like to wait for mistakes or force mistakes. 
He nearly got one from Roberts there. Do you need to be the aggressor, really, for the most part? I think, uh, psychology-wise, there is something... There's something to be said by really running up on a guy from way back and then as soon as you get to him, trying to make a move on him. And I think that kind of aggressiveness is, 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 a, is good, if that makes sense, because you kind of really, you never give the guy that you're passing the opportunity to sort of think maybe he's quick enough to hold you off. You just get there and you immediately get the move done. But maybe if you get a tough customer and it is hard to pass around here and... It can kind of come to the point where you just sort of have to go, okay, there's a little bit of an opportunity to slide up the inside here in, in maybe a place where you might otherwise think better of it. And, and there's a there's the possibility of contact there. I would say turns five and six are probably a, a good area for that kind of move. Mm -hmm. Dobbs did move around. By the way, P2 has swapped positions. The reason Paul Johnson got a slowdown on the final chicane and that is also something that could be very crucial about those turtles. He cut about 70% in towards the left-hand side of the track. That instituted a couple seconds slowdown, as you'll see right here. Yeah, it looked like he missed the first part. And to be honest, it's kind of smart to, to, to just take the slowdown, really. If you're carrying that much speed in, that you know that you're not going to make the second part correctly... It, it's way better to just take the slowdown than it is to take the risk of maybe hitting the outside wall. And Johnson now back to third spot. These two drivers, though, have been nearly identical in pace, even with that slowdown factoring the time. They haven't been able to get away from one another or pull away. They have pulled away nine seconds for the next spot, but these two have been attached to the hip. Yeah, and I mean, we saw that in practice and, and in qualifying as well. They're both very close to each other pace-wise, so I don't think that we should expect to see them kind of separating anytime soon we're 14 laps in now and, and they're they're a really close pairing obviously the leader is gone but they're kind of having their own good fight here for second I to wonder if johnson can get the spot but haynes and carroll that battle is also still being pretty hot it's now for p4 on the racetrack for haynes in front of carroll and as you can tell, Carroll wants that spot back. Takes a decent run into NASCAR 1. That's been one of the stronger points, but Hayes having a much faster run off of NASCAR 2. Remember, he doesn't have any aero damage. That 20 machine does. Yeah, and that's going to make it really difficult for the 20 to, to have any opportunities into these two chicanes because he's going to be down on straight line speed. And it's... It hurts you nowhere more than on the on the oval side of things here. So, I think if he's going to get back past, then his opportunities are, are going to be restricted solely to the infield. And we were talking about this a little bit before the broadcast too about some of that aerodynamic damage. As something's going on towards the back end of the field, some heaviness is going on around here where Dobbs is at. That is right now battling for some positions once again. That is around 12 for Charles Sumner. Is able to move up to the top 10. And have to take a look at this one. The 98 machine moving up two spots in a lap. And, and wow, they got together on the backstretch chicane there. That allowed the 98 to just waltz on by, Christian. Yeah, and that's that's the other thing, that if you get drawn into into a bit of a battle and, say, a third car enters the fray, it, it can be a nice opportunity for, for the guy behind to just sort of take advantage of anything that happens in front. And, and Sumner really did that there. He's, he's cleared him, and now he's built himself a little bit of a gap and he kind of just turned up, said thanks for the positions, and now he's leaving him to it. Yeah, Dobbs was the car that got loose, and now with the fights for 11 spot, Robert B. Saad Jr. drives right on by in his white, black, and purple machine. Up to P11, he'll try and catch back up for a top 10 position. So they get back towards a rhythm once more. Fastest lap last time by was by Paul Williams, the second, by the way, at 129. These drivers are currently around the 123 issues at the moment. Chatley, meanwhile, is right now in the midst of a battle again now because that 25 wants some of his spots back still. He 
He's already gone in back to seventh. He wants sixth spot back too. Yeah, obviously that spin cost him a, lo a lot of track position and he's just been slowly kind of picking his way back through. And uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of at this point of the run where the tires are, are really kind of worn at this point as to where he's going to have any opportunities. And the track temp, mind you, has been swinging a bit back and forth. You mentioned the 122. It went down to 117, but the cloud has shot back up to 121. So it's kind of going back and forth in terms of how little grip there is. Yeah, and, and it's interesting you mentioned that it's gone back up, and it's probably the worst time for it to go back up. These guys are... Uh, oh, I'm almost certainly coming up to the point where they're going to take their, their stop. I don't foresee any reason why anybody is going to stay out longer than 19 laps. And that we're right at the end of the tire life, and the track temperature is going up, so they're going to have even even less grip than they already would. Oh. He goes for a huge move on the outside. Cervantes so Moreno seeing an opportunity, sends the dive bomb for ages, moves himself up the six, still tries to fight though with Chatley. Chatley trying to ride the inside, can't get it to work, lets the spot go away for now, but Moreno getting a bit hot, loose on the high side of turn two. Cervantes Moreno stuck in a side-by-side -side battle under the walk crossover bridge. And finally Just got it done. Six. Yeah, that was a heck of a dive. Yeah, I was impressed he got that stopped. I thought there was no way he was getting that pulled up. But he, he made the corner completely. Obviously, he was a little bit hot for the exit, but it was a really impressive move, actually. Yeah, that uh, was it. an interesting decision. One driver has just ducked into the pits. That's Colton Lane. The first driver on the lead lap without significant damage ducking down. Should note the 60 has had damage all over the race car today so far. Yeah, he's had a he's had a rough evening so far, and I actually expected he might have moved up a little bit more than he has, but he's got significant damage there. Not really surprising to see him kind of make a short pit for some track position, but I think he'll be overall kind of disappointed with not being able to make more progress than he has. The fall-off difference is going to be about three seconds based on what we're seeing already. 118s to 121s for the top cars. Chatley has also just ducked down to the pit lane in the 59. Well, Dobson Sumner are still fighting on for spots because Sumner just ducked down as well. Now it's going to be curious to see when, say, these cars come in because we've seen a bit of that strategy work actually in the peak race last week. Yeah, I, I'm really surprised that we haven't seen anybody make a really aggressive undercut here. I, I, I think if 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 I was running, I honestly would have looked at pitting around about lap 15, just because that that undercut is so powerful. Uh, like we were saying, it's about anywhere between two to three seconds a lap. So it, we've seen how difficult it is to pass. The track position is huge. Even if you're going to be slower towards the end of a run, it's just not enough. Holly, the race leader, has ducked down. He's brought down Nick Ketchum, who he's just caught and left, along with them. So, the, again, the race leader, who has led every single lap so far, has now down to the lane, and will and Paul Williams II stays out along with Paul Johnson. Rob Haynes did follow him down to the lane. So, Williams II and Johnson, looking like they might go towards trying to get a bonus point. Yeah, I think I think if they want that bonus point, though, they're going to have to stay out for another two laps because Holly actually was still scored as the leader that yeah. time by, even though he was in the pit lane. Also seeing Cervantes Moreno and Zemke come down this time by. You're looking at Haynes now in the stall as he has the right side brought down to the track surface. The 25 is in the stalls. The left side tires back up now. And off and away goes Rob Haynes. 14.8 seconds is the average pit stop time. Everybody taking four tires and fuel. Looking back towards Williams and Johnson, though, as they work their way to the back stretch chicane. Now it's going to be curious which of those drivers duck in. They're going to be lapping Rachel Hunt, who stays on the high side, who's had a rough day so far in the purple and pink machine. But Williams is staying out. Johnson's going in. Paul Williams the second gets the bonus point for the lead lap. While Johnson decides to duck in. 
Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting play there, because I think he's cost himself a shot at second place by staying out that extra lap. I, I think he's going to be at least three to four seconds behind by the time he pits and, and does his outlap. So it'll be interesting to see if he can get back to him. I personally don't think he's going to, but I guess he really wanted to lead that lap and get that bonus point. He's just 33 seconds behind the championship lead, mind you, but outside the top 10. We'll have to see how the play goes here. John, again, Johnson went in. Roberts is in. B. Saad Jr.'s in. Colin Carroll's in. Alan Dobbs are all in. As you look at the pit exit here, and it's an interesting pit exit because originally, before they basically updated the road course at Charlotte International, at Charlotte Motor Speedway, the pit lane before that went basically straight onto the racing line until the update added essentially that concrete barrier and basically a hard left before you get to the speed up. Yeah, and you do actually have to be careful with that hard left, especially if you've got the uh, the pole sitting pit box. It's actually kind of easy to clip the wall on the exit. And I think even in the in the peak series race, race we saw people having issue with the with the actual exit itself. So it's it's quite challenging, even if it does feed out into a better position. Williams the second is in, so the number seven does duck down. Bradley Hawley already retakes his race lead in a mix of traffic. So Williams the second wants the last drivers on the lead lap to pit. As you look back at Hawley, who runs in the back in a Colton Lane, still laps him though. So now Hawley's got some damage, very small amount, but that could have been much worse as he just ran up in the back of lane. And, and lane it one, he just kind of, he kind of got a lot closer than I think he was expecting, and it's you got to be careful with that. He, he he does have a massive lead though, so even if he even if he had picked up damage there, I don't think it was actually going to hurt him too much, but still kind of proof that even as the leader with, with the lead he has, that it's it's still a it's still a tough race for him, and he still has to stay focused. Two cars yet to pit on the track. Mike Caterino and Rachel Hunt. Everybody else has ducked down. Holly's about to actually lap Hunt as she stays out of the way, lets him on by on the apron, in fact. So Holly in the lead by 18 seconds he's putting on a, on an absolute clinic today in his 184 car yeah he's done a he's done a superb job all, all through the evening he obviously had the pole by a significant margin about three tenths and he's really shown that pace just translates all the way through to race pace as well because he's he is gone p5 is also getting a bit interesting here make a p6 as you look at brendan chapley Currently trying to gain back time with the 25 machine, but Zemke is in the 120.5 range last time by his NASCAR Superstore machine. And is actually trying to follow the draft. Do you see that 21 matching the line of Chatley as he tries to arc into the final chicane? Oh, and Haynes has missed the chicane. And that's Mitchell Clark, in fact, that's in that's missed the chicane. Lap traffic ahead. Cervantes Moreno ends up stuck on the traffic. You see Haynes on his own, but you see the man who did miss the chicane. Mitchell Clark, in a bit of a different look today, said hello to the Monster Energy Grass logos. Yeah, he was, he was a lap down. I, I thought it was Haynes with them both being orange cars, but it, that was actually quite nice of him to just move, his, move himself out of that fight. I mean, you don't want to be the influence of a position battle, right? But you look at Cervantes Moreno. He still got stuck behind a lap car and lost a lot of time. Again, that's the 51. Let's go look back live as he's been able to get by Mike Richter. By now, three car lanes. So the, ga the, so the time he basically lost, he's been able to already pick up. But he's still got an air car to deal with. That's Mike Caterino. He is still going to have to deal with in the one machine who lets him by on the high side. Well, everybody else who is gaining time is still stuck behind Richter. Yeah, and it looks like uh, Moreno has managed to kind of make a bit of a breakaway here for this fifth place. And now there's the fight between Chatley and Zemke for sixth. Looking back towards Zemke. He is plus four from the drop of the green flag. Didn't have a good run of the final chicane, though. 
trying to gain it back on the braking zone. Lap car trying to let drivers find the bottom of the exit in turn one, able to do so as he's still about a few tenths of a second behind the rear end of Shetley. A difference of about seven tenths of a second to the inner loop. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if, if this lap traffic is gonna, gonna play even more into this fight here. I don't believe that there's any difference in terms of tire life between the two. At most, it's one lap in favor of Zemke, I believe. So maybe towards the end of the run, that could, that could play into it. But right now, I think they're pretty even. And Zemke said nearly hello to the Bank of America sign as you look back towards Pat Harvey. As we say hello to him about a minute and 27 seconds off the lead to lap down, but he wants positions. Lanes in front, but John Labaf is behind and is actually closing in a touch. Last time by Labaf in the 121-1s, 121.5 for Harvey. Yeah, Harvey's he's up five spots, but he hasn't really made good on the pace that he showed in practice. I, I honestly expected a little bit more out of him, but he's he's still in this fight. He could still maybe get himself up uh, up up maybe as high as the the last car off the lead lap, as it were. I mean, does have Branson Walter in front of this group by three seconds? Another six seconds in total to Alan Dobbs, and then Colin Carroll again is now a minute sixteen seconds behind the leader. That's about twelve seconds up the road. But three cards under a blanket fighting for P14. Lane gets the best of the runs out of the final chicane, the backstretch chicane. Well, Harvey doesn't have a great run. Labaf actually loses a ton of time through NASCAR three and four. Yeah, and he's gonna have to work hard in this last chicane to make that up. Looking back again here as Lane. Again, gets a good exit. Labaf hits the, the turtles on the final chicane. Oh, Harvey still trying to arc it down. Has a good run out of turn number one, but again, as quick as the run comes, it goes. Because you essentially, again, have to go right towards the left-hander before heading back to the right-handers. And Lane actually just went a bit wide there. He's giving Harvey a chance on the inside here. Side by side for the position. Harvey trying to right break early. Lane trying to have to go on the high side, working through turn six and seven. Nearly heads towards the advertising boards, has to get off the gas as he nearly hits the bath. Lane two loses two positions in the corner. Let's take a look at that one again because Lane had to try and get the high side of work. And that, of course, d isn't the best of lines. Yeah, you can see he was kind of doing okay. And then in the second half of the corner, he just he just went out onto that flat with the red and white there and, and as soon as you go out there you lose a ton of grip and obviously lost the two spots it'll be interesting to see if he can fight back I I kind of don't think he will be able to obviously he had those two bottled up behind him so he ends up losing two positions dropping to 16th he has gained two from the drop of the green flag though but Labaf is trying to get to where he started trying to pick up time again on Harvey and Harvey but again, get a good run. It looks like Harvey's more comfortable out to the final chicane, but it's compared to Labaf, but Labaf seems to be better in the middle portion of the track. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually just spotted that as, as Lane made his mistake, and I think the, the problem with that, though, is that uh, Labaf's kind of, kind of better at all the part of the track where there's no real opportunity to pass, and that's going to make it really difficult for him. You see how much time he can close up here. Tries to actually take a higher line, losing some time. That's where some of the preference goes back to the 67. Labaf taking a bit too much speed, nearly heading towards the Charlotte USA logos and loses all of the time and then some he had to that inner loop. So that's exactly what we're referring to, I think, there. Yeah, uh, and he's going to lose a lot of time there all the way down to the backstretch again. Speaking of time... One driver about to try and pick up time in position still is Zemke. He's closed up the time to Chatley. By now, just about a couple car lanes, and they also got him by the lap traffic. Yeah, it's all clear ahead of Chatley now, so this is this is really as true a, a one versus one pace that we're going to see right now between these two. Again, Chatley really strong through the gears. Up to already 148 plus miles an hour. Zemke currently reaching 160 on the exit of NASCAR turn two. Back towards turns 11 and 12. Chatley 
Trying to take the Arc Zemti, trying to attack those turtles again. But again, it's been talked about a lot of times on the oval side in the road course zone. Fast in, slow out. If you take slow in, a lot of times you could be fast out. Yeah, it's very true, especially for that backstretch chicane. There is a lot more of a time penalty to be had by by going in deep and, and missing the first the first left part, which really puts you offline for the second. But we can see that Zemke's got a bit of right front damage here, and, and again, that's that's going to make it even more difficult for him to stay with him on the oval part of the track. We see a little bit of a mistake from Chatley there through turn one. But it's going to make it really difficult for Zemke to pass if he is down a little bit on straight line speed. Or even with that aerodynamics affecting how the car turns. That time Zemke nearly went off towards the grass to get an X. While Chatley, who doesn't have that type of aero damage, only a little bit of it in that same area, looked a bit more comfortable. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing, that Zemke is having to push harder through the infield to, to kind of keep himself in play because of that damage, I think. Meaning you look at again, Chatley, up again through the gears. Back to about even speed right here, but this is right where they hit the brakes. Zemke taking a bit of a later braking line, trying to arc it differently, but again, it seems like on the where it shifts towards the right to the left handers, that's again where Zemke has been struggling with some of the damage, trying to go for the crossway. Yeah, and I mean, there it looked like he was just kind of a little bit offline, and, and on the exit, we, we saw that Chatley was kind of. He, he had a much straighter exit off the corner, and, and that really helped him and could pull a bit of a gap again. If we head back towards 8th, though, the gap is starting to close, it seems, between Eric Roberts and Charles Sumner. They do have some lap traffic to try and deal with, but Sumner has been running pretty decently. Now being held up, though, by lap traffic as he nearly ran over the back end of Caterino through 1 and 2. Yeah, Sumner's actually having a great race here. He's he's kept himself clean and he's he's really been capitalizing on mistakes from other people ahead of him. And he, he's up into the top ten now. And I imagine he's going to be pretty happy with how this race has gone for him. Sumner started in 13th position, but he also has P10 behind him. You might notice him in the backdrop. That's the 97 of Isan Juniors. Also tracked him down to around 122 flat last time by. The pace for Roberts in the twos, as well as for Sumner, the 122 twos. As these three drivers now getting pretty close at the edge of this top ten. The reason why, by the way, we've seen Colin Carroll fall out of the top ten, put these cars in, had to take a second pit stop. So Colin Carroll in 11 spot, a ways back behind these drivers by, uh, by about 20 seconds. Let's look back to the race leader, though, because as we've been discussing this, Howie has lapped his way up to 10th spot already on the racetrack. He has been a full second quicker a lap than most of the field. Yeah, he's just, he's got unbelievable pace and he's just, he's kind of kept everything together. And if anything, his advantage, he gets more towards the end of a run. So it looks like he's doing a great job of tire management. And I mean, the car is completely clean. He's just, he's, he's doing everything right right now. Last race, remember, he was in the pole sitter for that event. That got him two bonus points here tonight by doing so this time. Has the fastest lap. That's another point. Got a lead lap. That's another point. Most well, so that's laps. Lead laps. That's another point. So in other words, he's got himself a good point. So not just with this lead, but with the bonus points all heading towards his way by the end of this night. With about eight laps to go this time. Yeah, and I mean, it, it really doesn't look like anybody's going to trouble him, so he's definitely going for that maximum points hole tonight. The thing is, too, to keep in mind, if you get three incidents or less in a race, you also get a bonus point. Currently, the estimated points is one. Back to P6 again, because Chatley and Zemke are still fighting hard. Zemke still keeping Chatley within range. About a tenth or two difference, it seems. They're going back and forth each and every lap, though. Yeah, they can't really separate themselves at all, and I think that's where it's going to come, you know, come down to making a mistake for one or the other, really, to, to decide this fight. We've got nine to go, and the, the tire difference is probably evened out at this point between them. 
Sounds like someone's got a problem. Sumner has had a problem. He was ninth last time. Vi has already dropped to 10th. This is why. Oh, he just got really loose going into turn one. Let's take a look at this on board here. And you mentioned the looseness. We'll see it from right here on the corner exit. Yeah, we can see he gets on the brakes and the car's already going around before he gets to the corner. And he just kind of... That's the thing about the rhythm that he got out of shape and he went across the curb. But he was okay. But then... It looked like he kind of went, oh no, I'm offline, I've lost time, and he gassed up, and that's what really hurt him, because he then looped it around and got that wall, and I, I feel bad, I feel like I've cursed him there, I was saying how good he was doing. Nine seconds lost, while the lap traffic on this shot already missing his bump, the final chicane again to Mike Richter, so that's a server penalty again, but... Chatley and Zemke have got even closer. Another tent picked up by the 21 machine. Zemke, though, has a one-lap pressure tire difference than the 59 machine that he's trying to reel in. Yeah, it, it, it hasn't really kind of helped him much, to be honest. I I, I thought maybe it, maybe it would have played out a little bit differently, but this kind of comes back to what I was suggesting about the that there that not being an advantage in running longer. And we can actually see that if we look at the gap between second and third. Uh, Williams stayed out that extra lap, and consequently he's now five seconds behind second place. And I I'm actually surprised we didn't see more people do the undercut. See some of those details on the side pylon, but Johnson has actually been the faster of the two cars last time by compared to Paul Williams. Still looking at this battle as Zemke tries to go through. We look back towards those pit stop details and the lap comparison rather between Johnson and Williams. You see though the gap has been growing more and more. The difference was going towards the sevens way before losing two, ten two seconds last time. Yeah, but you, you can also see that he really wasn't gaining all that much. The gap's kind of been about five seconds since they pitted, and uh, and that's the scenario you put yourself in if you do that long pit, is that you know, you know that your tires are better, but you know that you need to push to make up the gap and, and the ground that you've lost. Whereas if you're the guy who pitted earlier and you've got that gap, you can, you can just manage it, you know? You can be like, okay, well, I've got five seconds, I can now run easier until maybe he gets to, say, two seconds back, and then you can run hard, and it, it, it just... Especially with this track, with how hard it is to pass, I, I'm really surprised we didn't see more people do the undercut. You've seen that pick comparison again. Again, just about a lap difference between those two drivers from when they ducked down. But in the end, the three-second difference of fall-off didn't overcome the three-tenths of a second that was picked up before. P3s also, though. Getting a bit uh, interesting here. We mentioned that seven machine. Rob Haynes trying to reel him in. But we also see this battle again between Walter and Harvey. This is P13. Walter having a bit of wheel spot. Harvey trying to pick up pace. That's This is just in front of P3. Yeah, and it looks, it looks like Harvey's got much more tire left. And we saw there kind of on that short shoot that Walter gassed up and had a huge moment. And Walter, though, having a better run onto the NASCAR Oval. Harvey again with a bit of a struggle there. Lost him two, three car lanes as they dive to the back stretch. Oh, he's One, gone in really again. deep. And Walter loses the back tires, loses the spot as well, drop him to P14. And Labaf now looking to try and take advantage. He's just behind the seven machine of Williams. And it looks like the, the 7 had a slowdown or something because he's just lifted way off. We'll have to take a look. I wonder if Williams might have just thought, let's let him fight. He had a very slow run through the entrance of the chicane. Have to back up a touch here because Williams on the entrance of the chicane went really slow as, this as the 99 went around. Yeah, I'm wondering if he just shortcut the chicane seeing it happening up ahead of him. Uh, or didn't want to run it back at him. I wonder if he thought, what, 
I don't want to risk running to the back of the 99 because if he went to normal pace, they, he might have been right on his rear, rear gearbox. Yeah, to be honest, I'm kind of curious as to what's going on with the 7 right now. He's he, Even after all that kind of panned out, he he really didn't go quickly at all through the last chicane, and he's he's dropped to 14 seconds behind second now, so I think there's something else going on here. Yeah, he is starting to struggle here. He does have that bit of right side damage, but for the most part, the car looks clean. Again, it's got to be something maybe tire-wise at this point, involving potentially that two seconds lost before that. Say if you lose control of the car, right? It ends up heating up the back tires. It ends up hurting the tires. Drivers that are looking to gain positions and not hurt their cars more, though, is Lavaf, who is looking to the high of the high side of the final chicane on Walter. Yeah, and we saw Walter had that that big that big moment, and so his tires are going to be really angry now. It's a good opportunity for Lavaf to get to get this move done quickly. I think it was Logan Crest that mentioned you end up driving one corner back. And this is on an oval, it takes a lap to get the tire back, or else you lose the tires for the rest of the run. It looks like Walter is trying hard to keep the tires away from falling apart the rest of this run. Yeah, I mean, obviously, he, he had such a big moment that he knows that his tires are going to be hot, and he would have definitely felt it as he, as he got to the next corner. So I, I imagine at this point, he's just kind of really trying to back off the pace and get get back in a good rhythm and hopefully kind of get the the rear tires back to to giving him at least some grip for these last five laps yeah three laps to go in fact for the drivers as bradley holly has been dominant again the lead is 24 seconds he has lapped a vast majority of the field already up to ninth position on charles sumner and has a chance potentially by the check of flight, the pace he's running to lap maybe Robert B. Saw Jr. But he hasn't had to fight anybody for position since lap, even before even taking the green flag because of the 17 tapping the wall. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he did exactly what he needed to do. He got away cleanly. He had a solid first lap and, and then just built his advantage from there. And he's honestly never been challenged all race. As, as, as soon as that first lap was over, he... He checked out, and he's just done a great job, is, is really all I can say. He's not made a single mistake all night. Two laps to go for him this time by. And the Zemke battle, by the way, has separated. It was a second difference before between them, but I think part of the problem is, again, Zemke had struggled again. We mentioned it off of NASCAR turn one, onto the banking, but two... He ended up losing traction through the final backstretch chicane and ended up separating that gap out. That's why now the 51 machine is between them and why Zemke is now multiple seconds behind the position battle. Again, it was on the back backstretch chicane. Yeah, and that's really kind of uh, made made life a lot easier for Chatley now. He's got a good gap. He just needs to, to roll it around the last couple of laps and, and he should have secured that sixth place. About a lap and a half ago to the race leader as you look now at P6. And Chatley has clean space for days. And now at this point, it's just get to the finish line. It looks like he's taking it very conservatively, this chicane, in fact, knowing he's got a car between him and the position and only about a lap or so to go. Let's take a look at that driver now of Hallway we mentioned in the race lead. He's getting ready to take the white flag and is looking to continue his dominance on the campaign. Remember, had a dominant performance at Richmond just last week. As he's coming out of the final chicane, now white flag waiting for him at the stand at the Charlotte Roval. One to go for Bradley Hawley. With a 26 second lead. For Hawley, as long as he keeps the car going. This would be his third straight win on the season. Isan Roberts looking to gain one last spot. They'll have about a lap and a half or so to go because they are currently in front of the race leader by enough of a cushion, it looks like, pending a mistake to, hold, to be able to finish their final circuit around. Again, it depends on if the 184 catches them 
and if they end up falling a lap down, for how much time they'll have for this fight. Biso has got a good opportunity here. He's a half a second faster than the last lap. He's doesn't look like he's going to be close enough into this back stretch to can, but if he can really get a good run, he might be able to try something into the front stretch one. Holly right now about a straightaway behind these two drivers. Again, the fight is for eighth position. They are reeling in Zemke and fairly quick now after Zemke's mistake. But Roberts again a good run out of the back stretch chicane. The driver that just left it is your race leader in Holly. For Bradley Holly, he's been the driver of the season so far. Into the final chicane, the Ford Mustang of Holly comes out of the final corners. And the Waterback Racing Machine will take his third checkered flag of the season. Holly dominates while b Jr. coming to their final lap. Able to make the pass through turns one and two on Eric Roberts. He sends it in after a mistake by Roberts heading towards the hot bird turn wall. Yeah, that's a costly mistake to make and Roberts knows it. He got really hard on the power there but actually made the gap even more between them. So... I don't think Roberts is going to get an opportunity to kind of even fight back here. I think I think Visor is gone. He's got a huge gap to him already. We'll take a look at that position change at the finish. But Visan Jr. is looking to try and reel in Zemke. Zemke currently a couple seconds ahead, two seconds total ahead. But Roberts is losing tons of time on the 97. Paul M. Johnson has already secured second spot. Just nine drivers finished on the lead lap. They'll have to dodge a lap car though. Mike Richter has just hit the wall in the final part of the backstretch chicane. Just to the inside of these machines as they keep on fighting. They're able to get by quickly. Roberts trying to get a good run. b Jr. didn't get a great run with the car spinning. Again, the fight for P8 will come to the final corner. b Jr. finishes in eighth. Roberts, the last car in the lead lap, says hello to the wall. Now, let's take a look at this pass. This was on the final lap, coming to the final first corner. You can see he was just, he, he was offline after the chicane and then went defensive, but really just completely overshot the corner and I just kind of let Beastle go back on the inside and we could see the frustration from, uh, from him after the flag right there, but a good race between those two and uh, a good ending there for, for Beastle. A great race indeed. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have your post-race coverage for the Precision Racing League Cup Series. For the Charlotte Roval, you're watching the Global Sim Racing Channel from Concord, North Carolina.
Welcome back to the Charlotte Roval for more coverage of the PRL Cup Series. After a thrilling race, which seen Bradley Holly dominate by 28 seconds for his third straight win of the season. As mentioned, he won from the pole and got all the bonus points he could for tonight, including the infinite point total. So he's got a max points day, winning by 28 seconds over Paul M. Johnson. Paul Williams the second finished third with Rob Haynes and Daniel Cervantes Moreno rounding up the top five. And the Chatley finished in sixth with Adam Zemke rounding out seven spot. The drivers that finished on the lead lap as well were Robert Bisson Jr. and Eric Roberts. We've seen their battle live and on replay towards the final lap of the day. The driver that finished one lap down first though was Charles Sumner to round up the top 10 Christian. And then we got Alan Dobbs and Colin Carroll with 11th and 12th. Pretty good runs by them. A bit disappointing for Carroll to drop six spots. Then we got Pat Harvey. I talked him up a little bit in the pre-race. He did pull up seven spots, but he comes home 13th and one lap down with Brandon Walter in 14th. John LaBeouf, he did a really good job, especially near the end of the race, picking up some good spots to come home 14th. Uh, 15th, sorry. And then Colton Lane kind of had a bit of a, a trying afternoon. He came home 16th. Mike Richter and Mike Catarino both pick up 17th and 18th with Nick Ketchum and Rachel Hunt 19th and 20th. The rest of the drivers finished five laps out or more. Demarius Hickenbottom finished with no front clip and had a rough day in 21st. Mitchell Clark 22nd. Trevor White finished only a few laps, 30 laps down in 23rd. Nick Pruitt 24th. Robert Engelman didn't even make the start to round out the drivers for today's field at the Roval. The man who conquered it and won his third straight race of the season is Bradley Holly. Bradley, Congratulations on your dominant performance. How does it feel to win your third straight race already on the trot? Pretty good. Um, it's a little worn out after this, uh, after this track. It takes a lot out of you with how rough it is. And my fellow commentator, Christian Schauner, who runs in the Peak Series, might maybe compare that to, say, a Bobby Zelensky type of performance. You were a second quicker every single lap all day and led all but one lap, uh, how good? How did you do it? Just practice. I mean, I I've been doing turning laps since probably Thursday, maybe even as early as Tuesday. I honestly can't remember with how long of a week I had this week, but uh, just figuring things out, how deep to go in into a into the braking zone, and you know, learning what the bumps will do to to the car or how the car will react to the bumps. Indeed. What else was the, some of the challenges here? Because uh, it's described by many, including Christian, as probably the most challenging track for these cars in real life and the virtual world. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Uh, with the tire fall off almost three or four seconds um, and how much your braking points have to change from fresh tires to very worn tires, it, it can be mentally challenging. Now, of course, as mentioned, your third straight win already. A max points day as well. You didn't even have a single incident point today. That earns you another one. But there's still a long ways to go in the season. How do you keep on focus now with a strong start towards the upcoming round of the season? I am just going to keep doing what I'm doing now. Practice, you know, run, try to keep my nose clean as much as possible in every race and try to get the best finish I can. Next race is at Dover. On October the 6th, is there anyone you want to thank before we let you get going and preparing for that race? I would like to thank uh, you guys for giving us another broadcast and uh, the Waterback guys. Uh, you know, they make they make it enjoyable to get on here week in and week out. and We get to have some fun and get some practice in. Congratulations on the win once again, Bradley. A dominating performance. Thank you very much. Bradley Hawley. With a 28-second victory today, our third-place finisher in Paul Williams the second is now standing by with Christian Challoner. Paul, well, it looked like you were having a, a really good fight for second there, but then you kind of fell away in, at the end of that, that, that second run. Now, there was a couple of laps where it looked like maybe something was up. Did you, did you have any kind of like hardware problems or something like that? Because you, you had a, a few laps where you really did lose a lot of time without anything really obvious happening in the lap. Yeah, no, there wasn't really uh, anything anything going on there. Um, had a really good battle going with with the other Paul, and um, 
I think it really just came down to the pit strategy. I took four tires because I didn't want to make a mistake. And I'm not sure if the other guys maybe just did fuel only or what, but I think that cost me a little extra time on pit road. I ran it hard for a couple laps and saw I wasn't really closing. So it ended up just kind of not being worth it. And, and towards the end there, there were some lap cars and they were battling for position. Um, I think Brandon lost it in the chicane in front of me. And I said, okay, it's time to, uh, time to back out. My next position backs like 15 seconds back. Let me uh, just kind of take it easy, not mess this up and let these guys battle it out for position. So that's what was going on there. Okay. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And that's actually one of the things that I did notice. I saw you pull to the top side in the oval and, and really back out of it. And I initially thought you might've picked up a slowdown penalty, but went back and looked and you hadn't. So yeah, that's, that's, that's really smart racing though. I mean, like you say, you, you knew you weren't going to get up to second and you had that big gap. So that, that really makes sense with, with regards to the, the pit strategy. Something that I was saying the whole race was how powerful the undercut was. And I noticed that the 17, he pitted one lap earlier than you and came out with that big advantage. And I, I maybe if you were to run the race again, would you consider perhaps doing the same or maybe pitting even earlier to kind of get that initial speed advantage? You know, I don't know. I was thinking about that and, and I may have pit a lap earlier, you know, without knowing when he was going to pit, if I would have led the lap before I was trying to lead, lead a lap. And when Brad came in, I knew I was going to come in shortly after and I checked the scoring and I, I still registered a second. So I knew I didn't get the lap. So I was committed to stay one more time. And I, I think that's, you know, I think that's when Paul came down. Um, honestly, uh, you know, I noticed lap times falling off maybe two seconds or so. So I really thought that it would make a difference, but you know, that far in the race, I guess what I didn't think about was, you know, the lap traffic and things like that, that you weren't going to be able to run a perfect line to, you know, to really hit those marks, you know, perfectly for the remainder. So, you know, uh, if, if I could do it all over again, I, I don't think I would have um, changed my tire strategy by any means. I don't think I would have pit sooner if I didn't get to lead the lap. Right. Then, yeah, that, that was actually something we did pick up on. We did see that both both you guys look like you were kind of going for that bonus point for the leading the lap. So I can't understand totally why you stayed out to do that. It, it absolutely makes sense from a points position. Now, next week, Dover, you, uh, you a fan of the track or is it maybe one of, one of the ones that you don't like to race? No, I actually really do like Dover. It's uh it's one of my favorite, you know, shorter tracks on the service. Um, it's just, you know, anytime we're at a short track, things are tight and you got to be real careful and, and, uh, you know, had some problems with Richmond, uh, because of that. So, you know, I like Dover, but ask me again after next. <laughs> That's fair enough, man. Well, thank you for coming and dropping by. And, uh, again, a, a great result finishing third before we let you go. Is there anybody you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to the league. Um, it's my first time uh, really racing full time in this series and I really enjoy it. And uh, a special for this race, a special shout out to all the guys that were, were a little bit off the pace. So much courtesy out there. It was unbelievable. Guys pulling over, not just for the leader, but for second and third allowed us to race that out. It's really cool. And that's why I joined this league because I know it has a good reputation. And a shout out to you guys too. Best league I've ever been a part of in terms of the broadcasting. Love the fact that I can sit down after this race and watch this and it's it's like watching it on tv it's fantastic so i'm trying to help the league find sponsorship if anybody's out there interested if you're interested in sponsoring the league please reach out to to me because i'd like to uh i'd like to add on to that and say we'll we'll throw we'll throw you on my car and my teammate Josue Tellez's car who couldn't make the race tonight so anybody out there that's willing to sponsor the league you'll get two cars out there as well and we try to run pretty good, so uh, you'll get shout-outs and interviews, too, uh, if we can make that happen. So Paul at IntegrityDigitalCo.com, Paul at IntegrityDigitalCo.com, if you're interested. Love to have you guys on board. And once again, that was our third-place finisher on the night, Paul Williams II, coming away in P3. Paul M. Johnson was the man who finished in second in the Paul and Paul show. Let's bring him on in with a 28 second gap between him and first and second. But Paul, strong race from you today. Uh, how would you describe your your eventful evening? Well, it was uh, really tough out there. Uh, lots of heavy braking zones, so sliding the wheels a lot. Uh, not not fun, but you know it, it was fun in some sections. But there were some that were just so hard all day. Which sections? Uh, the both chicane, uh, chicanes were really difficult. Um, 
I was constantly losing time all day. I'm really surprised I stayed in front of number seven. Um, that was really difficult. I, I liked racing with him the first few laps. Uh, we were having a good race there. Um, I guess I just got the advantage hitting earlier, um, got that extra uh, tire advantage for that one lap, and it let me pull away, and he, I guess he used him up trying to catch up. Yep, three seconds of tire fall off per lap. Big difference between fresher and older tires by the time you guys duck down here. But in the end, though, you're, it wasn't quick enough to catch up to Holly. What did you need to have or what did you need to do to have a chance at the 184 machine today? Um, just being a little more consistent because uh, I think I gained a little time on my pit stop. Um, but it wasn't enough because once he had a big enough lead, he, I mean, he could back it down and just cruise the rest of the race and not really run into any issues and, you know, still had tires to pull away at the end. He's just, he's fast every week. So it's, it's going to be hard to beat him, but, um, I think there's a future. The next track on the schedule is Dover. It's a tough track, especially with the draft package. Your thoughts on Dover. Dover's always tough. Um, it's it's kind of like a larger Bristol, I, I feel. Um, so there's going to be a lot of close calls, and you know, hopefully we can keep it pretty caution free. Um, you never know with those tracks, though. But um, I th I feel like I can get a feel of Dover. Um, it's just uh, doing some practice on on the track this week and the practice sessions, and getting a little bit more used to the track. Is there anyone you want to thank real quick before we let you go here for this top two finish? Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Team Zero Racing. Uh, this is a new new league that we're in this year um, with Club Bushido as our sponsorship, uh, car club sponsorship out of uh, Jackson, Tennessee. So uh, we'd like to thank them for being on the car. And uh, I'd like to thank my teammate, Nick. He wasn't uh, very quick out there today. He had some issues early on, but um, he, he got on the comms and was uh, helping me throughout the race, letting me know what uh, lap cars were doing and, you know, uh, gaps between first and uh, third. Congratulations on the second place, Paul. A very strong race. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys, for uh, thanks, guys, for the broadcast. That was Paul Johnson coming away second tonight here at the Charlotte Roval. Before we go, real quickly, Christian, your thoughts on Dover? Because from what I heard, a lot of speed with the downforce now with the 2019 package. Yeah, it's a very, very, very fast track now. Like you say, you've you've got the you've got the high downforce and you've also got the high power as well. So the the speeds are really quite incredible and the walls are very, very close and I think what we're gonna see probably is if is if there's any kind of slight mistake, it's gonna cause a a, a, a huge checkup at best and potentially a, a really big wreck at worst. So I think that'll be a really challenging race for those guys. Maybe not quite as challenging as this one was in terms of driving, but definitely definitely one of the toughest short ovals they go to. Be sure to tune in to see that speed, but we'd like to thank everyone for tuning in for tonight's exciting action for the Charlotte Roval. We'd also like to thank Precision Racing League for organizing this very strong and competitive series this season. Of course, a lot of championship conversation drivers, including Holly, on the campaign. We'd also thank, like to thank Holly Johnson and Williams II for joining us here in the broadcast booth for folks' race interviews. We'd also like to thank the companies that provide our software and hardware for our broadcast listed now up on your screen. Additional thanks to Jude Long, who provides our wonderful music. See the screen for how to get a hold of her wonderful work. Thanks to the team today as well, Christian and Sean. If you'd like to find out more about the Global Sim Racing Channel, including the upcoming races on the calendar, you can find it at the Global Sim Racing Channel.com. Or you can check out our social media on Twitter at GSR Channel. Facebook at Global Sim Racing Channel in one word. Or Instagram at GSRC underscore Graham. Don't forget to head over to our YouTube page and hit that big red subscribe button as well as the notification bell so you don't miss a moment here on the Global Sim Racing Channel. As mentioned, the next race on the schedule is at Dover, Delaware on October the 6th. Be sure to tune in for what should be a thrilling race, high speeds, high downforce, full 750 horsepower for the race car. And you can see that this upcoming Sunday, October the 6th on the Global Sim Racing Channel. We have some upcoming races for our series list on your screen until then, so be sure to check those out and mark them down your calendar. But until next time, race clean, race hard, and we'll see you on the track.